Acts, the research, part two. We uh, have been looking at the book Undeniable by Douglas Axe, subtitled How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life is Designed, and published this year by uh, HarperCollins. And uh, after reading the book, the question comes up, where does Axe get the confidence to say that we should believe our design intuition and ignore the scientific consensus? Or perhaps not ignore it, but at least discount it. Well, there are a couple of reasons in particular. And their paper that we looked at last week um, uh, in General of Molecular Biology, this is in the peer-reviewed literature, Extreme Functional Sensitivity to Conservative Amino Acid Changes on Enzyme Exteriors, and the one that we'll be looking at this week, uh, estimating the prevalence of protein sequences adopting functional enzyme folds. And uh, that is also in the peer-reviewed literature. It was produced, the lab that he was working at is the Barbraham Institute Structural Biology Unit and at the Barbraham Research Campus in Cambridge, which is different from where he was before he was doing postgraduate work in uh, Cambridge uh, at, uh, I've forgotten, I think it's the Center for Molecular Biology or something like that. Um, his other paper caused him to move out from there to a separate research facility. Uh, a little background. Uh, we're going to be looking at a protein called TEM1 penicillinase. And as its name implies, it breaks up various kinds of penicillins. It's found among other places in E. coli, the familiar colon bacteria, which means that it stinks to work in the laboratory. Uh, e. coli has a uh, cell wall that incorporates D-alanine. The reason for that is because D-alanine is harder for most other organisms to chew up because it's the opposite way from L-alanine and, and the uh, enzymes that normally would do a nice job of breaking up the protein don't do as well. So it's kind of a self-defense against, uh, among other things, us. Uh, penicillins link where D-alanine would link but then they don't cross-link effectively, therefore weakening the cell wall. And if there's enough penicillin actually causing the cell wall to bulge, uh, cell membrane to bulge outside of the cell wall, and eventually causing the breakup or lysis of the bacteria. Now, penicillinase is a defense against penicillin. It breaks up the active part of the penicillin, what they call the beta-lactam ring. So you see beta-lactam used occasionally. Um, uh, Penicillin-resistant re penicillins and cephalosporins are not easily broken up by penicillinase, which is why they're used uh, for bacteria that have resistance to penic plain penicillin G. Um, Clavulanic acid binds irreversibly to the active site of penicillinase. In other words, it basically acts like penicillin, only instead of getting broken up, it gets stuck there, which renders the penicillinase non-functional, which is why sometimes you use, uh, for example, amoxicillin with clavulanic acid, otherwise known as augmentin, for penicillinase resistant, uh, pardon me, for penicillin resistant organisms, such as, uh, well, actually, um, penicillinase can mutate no longer, uh, can mutate to no longer act on clavulanic acid, and then the organism is now resistant to clavulanic acid plus penicillin. So as you can see, the cycle goes on. Um, various uh, uh, either designed or natural uh, well, of course, they're designed too, but that's beside the point. Um, ways of, of uh, 
action and then counteraction and then counteraction uh, to the counteraction and then uh, it keeps adding up and now we have imipenems and all kinds of things like that that try to get around that kind of problem. Now this is actually a, a penicillinase with penicillin in there. I got this from Wiki Commons. Uh, they said anybody can use it, but just for the record, it's uh, there's the link for it. Um, uh, Doug's article begins. Uh, proteins employ a wide variety of folds to perform their biologic functions. How are these folds first acquired? An important step towards answering this is to obtain an estimate of the overall prevalence of sequences adopting functional folds. Since tertiary structure is needed for a typical enzyme active site to form, that is the whole ha thing has to fold up together, <clears throat> One way to, uh, to obtain this estimate is to measure the prevalence of sequences supporting a working active site. If the, if the penicillin won't fold, it's not going to do much in terms of uh, penicillinase. It's not going to do much in terms of breaking up penicillin. Hey, can you point to the diagram? I mean, uh, can you actually point to folds? The folds? Okay. Um, Let's, let's go back to where it's a little brighter. Uh, this is an alpha helix. That's one fold. This is another alpha helix. That's another fold. These blue things are beta sheets, and they're attached. It doesn't show exactly how, but they're attached. All of these are attached by hydrogen bonds. Um, this one about three and a quarter turns, and the, and the amid part, uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, attaches to the carboxyl part of the, of, the, of the, the one below it in the spiral. And so all of these spirals are held together by hydrogen bonds. And the same way with these sheets, they're all arranged so that there's interaction between the mid hydrogen and the, uh, and the uh, carbonyl carbon, uh, pardon me, the carbonyl oxygen. So they're hydrogen bonds. This little thing here. That looks like a fold to me. Well, it is technically a fold, but when they're talking about folds, they're actually talking about structures that are held together, a secondary structure. And the whole thing is folded with, you know, these two right next to each other, the, these two beta sheets next to each other, and then the, the rest of it is held. And once it's held in that position, there are certain residues that stick out there, or, or side chains if you prefer, that stick out their active groups in such a way as to pull the penicillin in, hold it in just the right spot, and then zap it with a serine in particular, as I recall for this one, and uh, break open the lactam ring, and then everything opens up again. Okay, to get back to where we were. Um, although the immense number of sequence combinations makes wholly random sampling unfeasible. Remember, there are more combinations than there are atoms in the universe by a long shot. Um, um, two key simplifications may provide a solution. First, given the importance of hydrophobic interactions to protein folding, um, they tend to fold with the hydrophobic stuff all stuck together, with, uh, uh, which excludes water and makes it more stable. Uh, it seems likely that the sample space can be restricted to sequences carrying the hydropathic signatures. Hydropathic simply mean, mean either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, attracted to water or avoiding water. Uh, signature of a known fold. Second, because folds are stabilized by the cooperative action of many local interactions distributed through this, throughout the structure, the overall problem of fold stabilization may be viewed reasonably as a collection of coupled local problems. This enables the difficulty of the whole problem to be, uh, be assessed by assessing the difficulty of several smaller problems. Uh, we take it into little pieces. Um, 
knowing that we're not being exhaustive, but at least we've got, uh, if the pieces are kind of random for their area, you get some idea of uh, how accurate this sequence has to be in order to make a penicillinase. Um, using these simplifications, the difficulty of specifying a working beta-lactamase domain is assessed here. An alignment of homologous domain sequences is used to deduce the pattern of hydropathic constraints along chains that form the domain fold. Starting with a weakly functional sequence carrying this signature, clusters of 10 side chains within the fold are replaced randomly within the boundaries of the signature, that is to say hydrophilic for hydrophilic and hydrophobic for hydrophobic, um, uh, and tested for function. And f uh, testing for function is real easy. You just grow the stuff in a uh, medium containing a certain concentration of uh, ampicillin in this particular, or, yeah, ampicillin. And if it grows, fine. And if it doesn't grow, then obviously the, 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 uh, it can't grow in that concentration of am ampicillin. Um, the prevalence of low-level function in four such experiments indicates that roughly 1 in 10 to the 64 signature consistent sequences forms a working domain. Combined with the estimated prevalence of plausible hydropathic patterns for any fold and of relevant folds for particular functions, this implies the overall prevalence of sequences performing a specific function for any domain-sized fold may be as low in w as 1 in 10 to the 77th power, adding to the body of evidence that functional folds require highly extraordinary sequences. Remember, there are 10 to the 80th particles in the universe. So we're talking a huge number, uh, a huge improbability. Introduction. Every quantifiable function that can be performed by proteins has a definite mapping onto the conceptual space representing all protein sequences. What can be discovered about these functional maps? Although the immense size of sequence space greatly limits the utility of direct experimental exploration, the sparse sampling that is feasible ought to be of use in addressing the most basic question of the overall prevalence of function. Progress on this front will both enhance our understanding of how new functional proteins arise naturally, which is his particular interest, and inform our approaches uh, uh, about uh, to generating them artificially. Uh, so we're going to have to do some pretty good design in order to make it work. This is a difficult problem to approach experimentally, however, and no pl clear picture has yet emerged. A number of studies have suggested that functional sequences are not extraordinarily rare, and he has five papers that he cites, while others have, uh, including I think one of his own, you may remember his earlier stuff suggested it uh, wasn't that bad. Well, others su uh, have suggested that they are. And here again, he cites one of his other papers along with several other papers. One of two approaches is typically used in these studies. The first, which could be termed the forward approach, involves producing a large collection of sequences with no specifi specified resemblance to known functional sequences and searching either for function or for properties generally associated with fun functional proteins. That is, let's just start, uh, put out a sequence and see what happens. Well, as you can imagine, if it's really 10 to the minus 77th, you're not going to get one in your laboratory, just period. If the relevant sort of properties can be found among more or less random sequences, this provides a direct demonstration of their prevalence. The second approach works in reverse from an existing functional sequence. Here the question is how much randomization is sequence known to have the relevant sort of function, in this particular case penicillinase, um, can withstand without losing that function. Although both approaches have provided important insights, they may have drawbacks that contribute to the apparent discrepancies. The forward approach has not produced a sequence with properties that place it unequivocally among natural functional sequences. 
They've tried it. They don't get anything. Well, they do get something, but not, not typical enzymes. What are the properties that have been found? For example, proteolytic stability, it can just hang together. Or cooperative denaturation, somehow that doesn't sound like a, a really enzymatic activity, actually warrants such placement, therefore remains an open question. That is, it's so rare we don't even see it happening. On the other hand, because the reverse approach starts with a sequence that is not just functional, but often nearly optimal, it may fail to take account of sequences having the relative, uh, relevant functional properties in a very rudimentary form. Also, the difficulty of taking proper account of sequence context is, presents itself when natural proteins are studied by making one or a few substitutions at a time. And I think that's one of his citations there. Uh, substitutions found to be functionally tolerable in ex such experiments, my apologies for not uh, changing the PDF there, might be tolerable only because the vast majority of the protein remains untouched. That is to say, yeah, if everything is perfect and you tweak one little area, unless it happens to be the critical or one of the two or three or four critical things, you don't destroy enzymatic function. But the question is, well, what happens if you change five of them, if you change 10, if you change 20? In the light of these difficulties, an important first step in the present study is to consider carefully what we mean by function in the first place. Now, I'm not reading the entire paper. Whenever you see yellow dots, those are my uh, ellipses. The focus then will be on mode of catal uh, catalysis rather than rate. Um, and you'll see why in just a minute. Something akin to tertiary structure, however crude, must therefore emerge in working form before natural selection can begin the process of refining a new fold. By assessing the difficulty of achieving the sort of structure needed to form a working active site, we therefore gain insight into a critical step in the emergence of new protein folds. How might the other difficulties be avoided? A recent study of the requirements for chorismate mutase function in vivo demonstrates a promising ap approach. Chorismate is a fairly complicated molecule that uh, is cyclicized, eventually producing tyrosine, well, actually, eventually producing phenylalanine and then tyrosine, and going by a slightly different route can sometimes turn into tryptophan as well. Um, depends on the enzyme, uh, whether tryptophan is a possible uh, a product of uh, the chain that goes through uh, chorismate. Uh, chorismate mutase gene libraries prepared in that work were constrained to preserve all active site residues, so, you know, Anything that actually touched the compound was left alone. And the sequential arrangement of hydrophobic and hydrophilic side chains present in a, a natural version of the enzyme. So basically, you know, if there, if there was leucine there, they could put isoleucine, they could put valine, they could put uh, phenylalanine, and they could put uh, methionine, which are all... Uh, but they couldn't put, for example, glutamic acid or arginine um, in that spot, and uh, and the, the same thing is true that if if you were using a, a arginine, you might substitute lysine. You might even substitute glutamic acid since they are charged, even though it's an opposite charge. But you wouldn't put leucine in there, for example. Within these constraints, the specific residue assignments were essentially random resulting in numerous disruptive changes through, throughout the encoded proteins. The prevalence of functional cores mate mutase among sequences carrying the specified hydropathic pattern was estimated to be just 1 in 10 to the 24. Now, that's, 
not too bad. The thing about chorismate mutase, which is the molecule on A, is that it's a very short molecule. It's uh, around 100 um, amino acids. The one we're going to be dealing with is the letter B, and that one has 153. It actually has 253, and they didn't mess with. I, I think about 60 in the front and about uh, uh, 40 in the back or something like that. They only messed with 153 of the residues. So, so this, is a, this is a conservative estimate, not a liberal estimate. Uh, that is to say, it estimates the, the, the estimate will be uh, that a higher proportion of, uh, of uh, uh, amino acid residues can be switched uh, without, uh, without messing up the enzyme than what is probably true in real life. So keep that in mind. In the view of the rarity of sequences carrying the pattern among all possible sequences, and the relative simplicity of chorismate mutase fold, which you saw is pretty simple, this result suggests that the sequences encoding working enzymes may generally be very rare. By the way, the real chorismate mutase actually has two of those uh, intertwined with each other. Um, Further exploration of this possibility should address two points. First, it is important that enzyme folds of more typical complexity be examined. And second, since many different folds might be comparably suited to any given enzymatic function, it is important that we have some way to factor this in. In other words, if the prevalence of sequences performing a particular function en enzymatically is our primary interest, then our analysis must not presume the necessity of any particular fold. Maybe something is folded in an entirely different way will do the same job, and we have to take that into account. Experimental approach. The use of mixed-base oligonucleotides for simultaneous randomization of a complete sequence, as in the chorismate mutase work, becomes increasingly problematic for longer sequences. It's just a technique that you can't make work, you know, past about 100 or so. An alternative approach applicable to sequences of any length is first to degrade the whole fold by widespread substitution and then to produce libraries having locally randomized regions within this barely adequate initial structure. Why degrade it? Well, we'll find out. Basically, if you have a really well-designed enzyme, you change one or two, it doesn't really matter. But if you have something that's you know, mostly de degenerate, just enough to enable you to get some enzymatic activity, then if you degrade it a little further, one or two or three more mutations, and it's gone. By the way, that process is what happens uh, in genetic entropy. None of the uh, changes are death deadly by themselves, but they're kind of like rust. They gradually eat things out. Skipping a paragraph and a half or so. Sequence constraints may then <coughs> be assessed by the frequency of functional variance in these libraries. The importance of having an extensively degraded initial sequence may be illustrated more fully by considering the effect of the selection threshold on the outcome. Because the reference sequence has virtually no capacity to buffer the effects of further disruption, it's barely hanging on as it is, the quality of side chain interactions within the randomized region must be maintained in order for a variant to pass. By performing several such experiments at various iter locations in the structure, it should therefore be possible to estimate the fraction of side chain specifications providing interactions that are just sufficiently favorable to support low level enzyme function. And this is nice because you can grow these things in whatever concentration of ampicillin you want. If they don't grow, well, you know it's not good enough. If they do grow, you know it is. And not only that, but you have an estimate as to how good the function is. 
For technical reasons, explained below, it will not be feasible for local randomization to be performed at all amino acid positions in the reference sequence. The constraints for forming a functional, functioning large domain will instead be sampled in four separate randomization experiments covering just over a quarter of the positions. The positions sampled will therefore need to be reasonably representative of the whole domain, and it is particularly important that pivotal residues not be overrepresented if we want to avoid exaggerating the constraints. If, uh, if our randomization includes the central core that's doing the actual work, well then, in those things, uh, you may not be able to do any substitutions, or perhaps you can only do threonine for serine or something like that. Results in discussion. Identification of lower bound selection threshold. The natural function of beta-lactamases, pr protecting bacteria from the effects of penicillin-like antibiotics, provides a simple means of selecting functional variants over a wide range of thresholds. As with any se selection system, though, there are limits to the useful range. At the low end, Escherichia coli strains have some innate resistance to common penicillins as a result of both uninducible low-level hydrolytic activity of AMP-C and the action of the Acrab multidrug IFLUX system. It has a drug pumping out uh, function that just takes uh, certain, uh, certain things, including uh, toxic drugs to it, and pumps them out of the cell. And so, it, you know, it is not an infinitely low thing. You put in a molecule of penicillin, it'll kill a bacterium. Or even you put in five molecules and it'll kill, kill a bacterium. Um, it actually can sustain, um, as you'll see, five mi micrograms per milliliter. Just ordinary bacteria with no special penicillinase. By the usual index of resistance, minimum inhibitory concentration, abbreviated MIC, the physicians among us will recognize that. The E. coli strain used in this work has an innate ampicillin resistance measuring five milligrams, pardon me, five micrograms per milliliter. You put five micrograms per milliliter in, the stuff will grow. Ten, it won't. In principle, then, we can select ampicillin-resistant clones without interference from innate resistance by using this level of antibiotic. However, when attempts were made to produce a reference sequence using this selection threshold, sequences that pass selection were found to carry mutations that would eliminate function by the known enzymatic mechanism. For example, a 36 residue deletion tolerated at this threshold precludes formation of much of the active site cleft by removing a substantial part of the large domain core. Eliminates two important catalytic residues and prevents a stretch of 29 remaining residues from adopting its original conformation. Figure three, and I'm showing that to you now. This is actually a stereo. If you um, get the original paper and, and you take those two images and you uh, allow one eye to see one and one eye see the other, you'll actually, yeah, it, can't do it from here. Don't try. <laughs> uh, I, I guess those of you who can cross your eyes might be able to see something, although I think it would be in reverse then. But uh, uh, so these, these images are very similar to each other, of course. But the, the thing of it is that you see this, uh, this red stuff is left alone by that mutation, but all of the yellow is gone. And these two green things that are part of what attacks of penicillin are also gone. I think actually one of them is here. And you can see it's essential to the function of the enzyme. And then, of course, this blue is now attached down here where the uh, uh, yellow was attached. And so it doesn't, it doesn't sit where it belongs either. And so basically you have destroyed most of the enzymatic activity. However, even when you do that, uh, residues crucial to the function of class A beta lactolactamases. Um, yeah, that's actually how somehow somebody missed that in the proof. Um, it, it's on the next page. So I think what happened was it was supposed to be lactamase, and it and it automatically hyphenated, and somebody added it back. But whatever, however that mutation happened, it did. Um, 
serine 70 and lysine 73 can be replaced in this deletion mutant without affecting its ability to confer resistance at this level. Whatever the mechanism of this resistance, then it is safe to conclude on the basis of this evidence that it differs fundamentally from the well-studied mechanism of class A beta lacrimases and hold it in just the right place, hit it with the serine, break apart the bound. Um, assessing the sequence uh, st uh, constraints for this uncharacterized mechanism would be a worthwhile step toward characterizing it. A preliminary randomization experiment shows the constraints to be very low, unpublished results. In other words, um, it doesn't matter what you do with this thing, it's pretty hard to mess it up. Consistent with the indifference to alteration described above. But of course that also means you can't improve it very much either. The sequence carrying the 36 residue deletion is found to confer an ampicillin uh, minimum inhibitory concentration of 10, that should be micrograms, I missed that. You can see it's micrograms down below. Uh, micrograms per milliliter, which amounts to 0.1% of wild-type TEM1 activity. Uh, the TEM1 is 5,200, and uh, so if you do 10 minus 5 divided by 5,200 minus 5, it's 0 0.01. So what they do is basically they say uh, that's a level at which we will ignore things. Um, if this is typical of sequences working by the uncharacterized mechanism, interference from such sequences will be eliminated by placing the selection threshold at this level. When I was pulling this in, uh, I had to replace all the micrograms, and I just happened to miss that one. Um, it takes a micro and turns it into an M. Um, that's another way of mutating things, by the way. Uh, homologous sequence alignment. And I'm going to skip down a little bit. The resulting set of 44 homologs, there are 44 homologs to a different kinds of uh, penicillinases that, well, we'll see, provide substantial sequence diversity and how much we're going to look at, while permitting sequence alignment with very little ambiguity. And here is figure five. And you can't read these numbers, and don't worry about it. If you're interested, you can go back to the paper. It's a little bit clearer, but it's still a huge thing. Um, what I will tell you is most of these are in the 40s. There's some in the 50s. There's some in the 30s. The highest I could find is 77%. And the lowest that I could find was, in fact, uh, around 32%. But what that means is that in the best matches we have, a quarter of the sequence things are entirely separate from each other. That's a, that is to say, the sequences are not alike. Most of them are less than 50%. Less than 50% of, uh, of the side chains are the same in all of these, the, the residues. But, if you take the 11 most, uh, most similar to TEM1 and, well, actually the 10 most similar to TEM1, 10, uh, TEM1 being its, the uh, 11th one, you will notice that they fold in almost precisely the same way. Oh, there are a few little areas here where there's a little extra loop there. There's a little disorganization here. There's a little disorganization here, but you know, these line up extremely well. There's very little difference in how they, uh, if you do x-ray crystallography and find out what their structure is, it's virtually the same. And uh, here's the sequence of those 44, and if you go through them, you can see how much difference there is. Um, that table summarizes it. And here's the parts that he's going to mutate. He's going to mutate these 10 in green, uh, another set, he's going to mutate these 10 in yellow, and these 10 in bl blue, and then these 10 in uh, magenta. And in just a little bit, you'll see uh, what they look like when they're actually being done. Finding a reference sequence. Dramatic loss of enzyme function can be achieved with a small number of highly disruptive changes. So maybe one change in the, in the key uh, amino acid residue. But 
uh, even without direct modification of the active site, if you put a proline in just the right place, it'll mess the whole thing up. The objective here, however, is to introduce a large number of mildly disruptive changes so as to render many side chains suboptimal throughout the fold and kind of make it all shaky. Basically, kind of rust it out a little bit if you want to think of it that way, instead of taking a ball peen hammer to the, what you're doing. Okay. Uh, relative to, it, again, we're skipping down a little ways. Relative to TEM1, the reference sequence carries 33 substitutions scattered throughout the large, through the large domain, 29 of which are represented in the alignment. Substitutions shown in boldface in figure six, I'll see also figure seven A, we'll see that in just a second. Um, substitution of key active site residues in this sequence causes loss of function, indicating that the 10, uh, missed that again, 10 microgram per milliliter selection threshold is sufficient to eliminate sequences functioning by the uncharacterized mechanisms encountered previously. And uh, in that, this figure six, and whenever you see a bold one, that's one that has been changed from the original sequence up here. And, you know, you, you can look it up. I advise you to do it on the, on the page instead of on this slide. And here's the, uh, uh, again, this is stereo views. So that, you know, you can see things in three dimensions if you look at it properly. Um, and you can see here's some of the uh, amino acids that have been uh, altered. Um, and then the extra ones that are going to be altered include the yellow, the green, the blue, and behind here, behind that mess, the magenta. So he hasn't done everything you could possibly do. It's not exhaustive. But it is kind of representative, and he has avoided those areas that are right around the penicillin that uh, uh, you know might actually be involved in the uh, uh, in the penicillinase itself. Now, implications: the exponential relation between uh, relationship between possible sequence combination and chain length makes exhaustive experimental searching of sequence space impossible for anything but small peptides. You know, there, are, there isn't enough time in the entire life of the universe, even assuming evolutionary time, for one to even start getting, uh, doing the experiments that would be necessary to exhaustively search. Simplifying assumptions will therefore always be essential for treatment of the spaces corresponding to proteins of biological significance. Yet, given the importance of these concepts to our understanding of such basic things as protein folding, stability, and evolution, the difficulty of achieving anything like certainty should not deter us from exploring the validity of such assumptions. Since they need not be provable to be testable, that is, they could be disprovable but not provable, we can reasonably hope for convergence upon correct ideas through a succession of testable hypotheses. The per position geometric mean calculated from the four pass rates is 0 0.38. It's calculated like that. Uh, uh, and then uh, by the above assumption, this should be interpreted as an upper bound estimate of the mean likelihood that a side chain compl that complies with the large domain signature will form adequate interactions with neighboring signature compliant side chains to create a, a functional beta lactamase. And skipping down a little bit further, there's a whole involved uh, discussion, which if you're really into it, I advise you read, but uh, this at least uh, this is kind of the summary that he gives. Since the four randomization experiments provide an upper bound estimate of the likelihood of solving the local problem for a 10 residue set, the likelihood of the joint solution may be estimated by applying the above per position mean 0.38 across the domain. The resulting figure, 10 to the 64th, uh, 0.38 to 153 power. Remember, this is an upper signature because they have deliberately avoided the critical. Uh, 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 amino acid residues. Um, 
which uh, equals 10 to the minus 64. You know, um, uh, exponential powers rapidly increase. Um, is thus an upper bound estimate of the prevalence of functional sequences among the whole set of signature compliant large domain sequences. Skipping a little further down, again, there's a, a discussion that uh, you might not want to miss if you're, if you're doing it carefully. If set S is about 1,000th the side of set H is above, then the proportion of all sequences of large domain length that perform the specified function by means of any tertiary fold, that is, fall within the dark position, portion of F, which is part of their f previous discussion, is estimated to be in the range of 1 in 10 to the 77th to 1 in 10 to the 53. Now, interestingly, that's a range. You may notice that the 10 to the 77th got into the, the, uh, um, the paper itself and was largely accepted by the people who cite the paper. And i um, skip down to the end and then uh, give you my take on it. Axe reaches the conclusion that for 153 amino acid region of beta-lactamase, there's actually 253 uh, amino acids in the entire protein. So this is definitely a uh, low estimate. The probability of finding a significantly active enzyme with the proper folds for natural selection to begin work on it was 1 in 10 to the 53 to 1 in 10 to the 77th. And again, that's probably, this is extremely unlikely. There have only been 10 to the 40th cells on Earth given the standard time scale. There's not enough time to test it. The probability of getting one right is 10 to the 37th or thereabouts, which is what? Uh, 10 trillion, trillion, trillion. Uh, ungodly number. There are only 10 to the 80th particles in the entire known universe. The article, incidentally, was published in the peer reviewed literature. This is not some creationist or intelligent design publication. This journal of molecular biology. It has been cited 102 times according to Google Scholar. I took the liberty of looking up the first 10 citations. There were scaled in how often those papers were cited. And uh, none of those first 10 list, uh, listed citations criticized Axis findings. Now, to be fair, two of them, as far as I can tell, didn't even mention Axe. I don't know how, that, uh, how Google was giving me that kind of stuff. So really, to be fair, it's none of the first eight listed citations criticized Axe findings. But still, it's a very low number. There are many proteins much larger than 153 amino acids long. So if you think beta-lactamase is a tough one, Wait till you see ATP synthase. One can see why, for acts, the evidence against blind processes creating protein is overwhelming. Design is the obvious alternative, and proteins share many features with known designed objects, including digital creation. Acts can afford to say that we should trust our this innate design instinct rather than the current scientific consensus. Because the current scientific consensus can't deal with this problem effectively. <coughs> I think his work was important and I'm glad he did it. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Nobody wants to comment? Ariel. Uh, this is rather, of course, uh, convincing evidence that the scientific data does not fit the current scientific ethos. Yeah. Uh, which tells you that science is a sociological 
Well, it's partly and sociological. It's not partly, completely. Partly, yes. Uh, partly sociological and, 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 and so on. But to me, the uh, intriguing thing of this thing was, uh, and this came out last time, but also when you discussed it, that uh, you can have uh, a lot of mutations that don't affect the system. That's right. But well, if you think about it, if you have a wrench, you know, the, 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 the threads on the wrench have to be correct. But the handle can be all kinds of different shapes and still work. Yeah. Uh, but eventually you reach a, a threshold level where it stops. Yeah. Now, if uh, you don't have a handle, it's not going to work. Just to take an example. I have uh, puzzled a little bit, and I don't know if I'm extrapolating the wrong direction here, over the fact that we have so many bad mutations but uh, we don't die. Yeah. And I, I see I see some relationship here between this. Until we get enough. Until we get enough. Until we get enough. Then we're going to re really uh, yeah. run into trouble. Yeah. We crash. And, and the interesting thing of it is that mm -hmm. the, de the decrease with any one mutation is so, so slight that natural selection can't find that mutation. You know... So the uh, so the bacterium loses it from fifty two hundred to fifty one fifty. The chances of bacteria being selected for the fifty two hundred over the fifty one fifty are virtually zero. Or the fifty one fifty to fifty one hundred are the fifty you know, uh, but as you keep chopping away at these things, eventually it starts putting you in a place where it doesn't work at all. I presume this has something to do with um, the idea that, well, we're, we're, we're mutating. Every person has what? 120 100, new. 160, yeah. anyway, a different figure. Anyway. Right. A lot of mutations that their parents didn't have. These are de novo. Plus their parents' mutations. Yeah, well, sure. I mean, it just adds up. Uh, but this does not uh, destroy us until we reach a threshold. Now, I wish I knew what kind of level we, or what kind of data we could have to uh, determine when are, going to, when are we going to reach that threshold in an organism. And he, he arbitrarily drew it there at some yeah. level. Yeah. Uh, but sooner or later, this is going to. Um, cause some serious effect. In That's human. right. That's right. Now think about this. We're, there we're, are we're, a lot of sociological things that influence this, so it's not all genetics so you, you, with that caution. Um, if you look at the replacement rate for humans in Europe, it's down around 1.3 or something like that. It's well below 2, especially in places like Russia. That's a problem. You're speaking of population. So population, yeah. yeah, yeah. The population yeah. of Europe is shrinking, sure. and they're making up for it by getting people from elsewhere. They said Europeans were on top of the heap. Do you think that's due to mutations, though? <laughs> that that slow reproduction is due to mutations? Do you think? Well, I, I think that there's, there's other factors. Uh, one of them is the uh, widespread availability of abortion. You know, we're getting rid of children. Uh, let's just be blunt about it. Uh, well, is it that the zygotes don't survive? Well, uh, you know, uh, an abortionist can take out a zygote pretty easily. I, I'm just I'm just thinking of this occurring naturally. No, birth control is one of the other things too. Uh, that that is true. It's mm -hmm. it's partly birth control, but the thing of it is that we are seeing increased levels of infertility as well. So when you want the kids, you can't have them. And if you delay mm -hmm. childbearing until you're 30 or 40, why well, that's also influencing that. Do so, we have? But the however it's happening, even if it isn't all which I don't think it is, 
but even if it isn't all genetic entropy, we're actually approaching a level where society is not sustainable. Well, do, do we have good figures on this increase in infertility, and do we have any idea what the cause is? In other words, is it mutations of the zygote, of the uh, sperm and the ovum, and, uh, we do versus, know that versus other factors? We, we do know that complaints of infertility are up. Now, is that all societal? I don't know. I suspect, though, that uh, it actually is going up. Just like the innate intelligence of humans is, at least by the literature, di documentally going down. Yeah. Well, I, uh, that's very obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at our election. <laughs> in, the, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. It reminds me of the, the movie Idiocracy. But anyway. Yes. Well, I thought, I thought IQ is going up with more education, but then I looked at who we have to, to vote on this coming Tuesday, and I really think we're headed downhill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think you're right about that. <laughs> That's a Tuesday. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. That's right, that's right. We picked the two. My, my apologies. Um, <laughs> this, this sort of um, presentation is, I think, convincing from a technical standpoint. My question is, is how, how communicable is this? In other words, it, is this convincing to somebody who doesn't understand the technical aspects I think that is why Doug Axe wrote the book that he did, is because what he was trying to say is everybody knows this. You just get talked out of it, and you shouldn't have been. Kids of atheists think that there's a designer, <coughs> and they have to be educated out of it. But this particular protein folding is, my feeling is, is that if you communicate in a, in a short, concise sort of way, uh, you'd almost have to refer not to the study so much as refer to experts who say, yeah, it really is true. It yeah, and then you get in a battle of experts, and that's what he's trying not to do. He was Just a minute. Uh, we want your comments. For posterity. Well, he was essentially kicked out of the original lab he was in. That's right. Uh, and then had to go elsewhere. He had to go elsewhere. This is from elsewhere, right. and right. he's still. Uh, and, but the, the funny thing of it is, everybody knows that Doug Axe is a uh, intelligent design specialist. He's one of those people. Right. And yet, the study keeps getting cited and cited positively, which means that he did good enough work that everybody, everybody really knows this in the scientific community, too. Well, they couldn't refute him on a scientific basis. They did it on a philosophical basis. They yeah. They refuted him, yeah. Well, they don't even refute him. Basically, they ignore him on the philosophical basis because they can't refute him on the scientific basis. If they could, believe me, they would. Well, they kicked him out, basically, on the fact that they didn't want to accept him. Yeah. yeah. Which goes to show that, at least in certain parts of it, science is more sociological than it is purely scientific, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, okay. Are you done? Um, the, the protein folding, my understanding is that if you create artificially in a lab, a sequence of amino acids, and then you just let it go and let it sort of fold on itself, that it's not going to fold in the functional manner. Is that correct? That is correct. And that it requires, the chicken-egg scenario, it requires another protein to be able to fold it correctly. Well, it depends. Uh, some proteins will fold themselves and very nicely, thank you. Other proteins won't fold unless they're put in a special housing container that bends them here and bends them there and, and kind of uh, helps the process along. It's called a chaperone protein. Um, 
And so it depends on which protein you're talking about. This one is supposed to fold itself. But even the chaperone proteins are not going to fold right unless they have enough of a structure. See, and the, the point of it is, he's saying that only 0.38 uh, uh, or 38 percent of the protein has to be in the right amount. But when you realize that you're doing with 153, well, actually 253 residues, and then you got you know other proteins that are even bigger than that, 38 percent of that being in the right order is still a huge number. That even if you grant that, oh yeah, you could replace this, you could replace that, you could replace the other, that at some point you reach a limit and the limit is nowhere near to where, oh, we'll just uh, you know, do 30 proteins and we'll get a functionally folding one. I mean, it, it strikes me that the, the functionality of a protein like that, it, it seems like it's highly dependent upon what parts fold in sequence. Correct. Um, and so you could have those, those, those sequences is again a whole, you know, one-fifth times, one-fourth times, you know, it's, you know, the probabilities become, I don't know, perishingly small, but yeah, just, just for the order to be correct. Astronomically small, yeah. But that's not what he's talking about here, is that right? Not the order. He's talking about the order. Okay. He is saying that, yeah, you can use, okay, you can use isoleucine for this, you can use valine for this, you can use, but, you know, you can't use glutamic acid or the whole thing won't work. But, uh, you know, and that... Uh, because the order of the folding doesn't work or it doesn't fold, or it folds maybe not at the right angle. It could fold not at the right angle, but however it folds or doesn't fold, it doesn't fold into the shape that it needs to be to nestle penicillin in there and then tweak it. Or nestle lactic acid in there and tweak it and putting it into acetyl-CoA. Which, you know, there's a whole, uh, there's, if you've ever seen those biochemistry designs that go, you know, five, six pages of, of uh, what, four by six feet or something like that, and there's this, you know, the Krebs cycle is in one spot, and every single one of those places where it goes from one to another, there's a protein that's doing that. And, for example, in the Krebs cycle, if you don't have all, what is it, eight proteins or something like that to get all the way around the circle some? Might be ten, I'm not sure, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. And all of them have to be there in order to get the Krebs cycle to work. Maybe the worst one is ATP synthase. You have to have a membrane to separate low hydrogen ion concentration from high hydrogen ion concentration. And then you have to have this gigantic protein with what, 15 different protein, some, some ungodly figure like that. And they all have to work well enough together to A, stick to each other, and then B, to allow hydrogen to go in from one end to the other, from one end to the other, from one end to the other, in specific areas. In the meantime, turn this little thing where it accepts ADP and phosphate and then tweaks it and then chinks it out. And it, it, it's... Are, are you talking about cytochrome? No, I'm talking about ATP synthase. Okay. And that is in every organism known to man. There is not an organism anywhere that we know of, and no reason to suspect that there will be, that doesn't have ATP synthase. Because if you can't make ATP, you can't get energy to the cell to do anything else. Is the cytochrome... And that's 15 of them. And let's say, uh, you know, it's 10 to the 77th to get one, and 10 to the 77 to get the other. Well, you can see where these numbers are going really fast. And that's why the other side doesn't want to talk about it. Because if we get into that kind of a discussion, they know they lose hands down. That's why they don't even want it on the table, because they know if it gets on the table, they're in trouble. So the argument will be, oh, look, there's a squirrel. 
<laughs> you think if we get overwhelming evidence <laughs> that that's going to change the majority viewpoint as is? Actually, in this case, I think it will. I don't think that there being a God or there not being a God is the final question. I think the real final question is what kind of a God. But I think that I think that 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 the oh we don't need a God at all. I think that stuff will eventually fall, and will be there will be little places you know like Albania that still keep the faith. <laughs> <laughs> But, North, um, North Korea. But doesn't that we'll continue on, and everybody else will say, "Oh, okay, come on, guys, let's quit." But doesn't the Bible speak about scoffers in the last days? I don't think well, it's speaking about Albania. Okay, the scoffers—they don't say there is no God. They say all things continue as they were. It's slow, gradual change. Sounds and of course, with that like slow, a... gradual change, you don't have a week. With a seventh day memorializing it. This is, this is a deception of methodological naturalism. Of course. And the funny part of it is that the ground will have been cut out from under it because once you have a God, why do you have to have lots and lots of time? So could, uh, could, could, could they go halfway in between and... and uh, exactly. Right. So look at that's where the Catholic Church has positioned itself according to the popes and more than one pope now. But well it, it it is it is. Well you have to remember the Catholic Church got burned really really bad with Galileo. And they're not touching that fence again. It's like a dog fence to them. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've ever seen a dog that touches a dog fence. And uh, maybe once, maybe if you're lucky twice, and he'll give that thing three feet. Guaranteed. And that's what we've got. The Catholic Church got burned once, and it's not going there again. It's just not. It, it accepts science. Right. And the crazy part of it is, actually, you, you have more evidence for uh, Lyell being an anti-biblical scholar than you do for Darwin. Darwin was operating in the milieu he had. Lyell consciously said, we have to free the science from Moses. <coughs> and that's where the final and that's one of the reasons why I don't want to just stop here and um, after we get done with this I'm going to show you a movie that doesn't stop here because well, the, because I, the, 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 the next issue above the horizon is you know how fast how long did it take I think that's what, where the issue will be end up as being one of time. Yeah. This is where the Sabbath comes into picture, mm -hmm. where the geologic column uh, mm -hmm. ages and so on comes into the picture. This is where uh, I think... It also can, it's where the authority of the Bible comes <clears> in. <throat> I, I just don't see, I, I don't see science surviving this material. Of course, I, I think more and more scientists are believing in God now, I suspect, for this, yeah. this Pew Research study. My understanding right. is that it's now reached a majority, and all that has to happen is the majority realizes well, that they actually are the majority, and that whole thing will flip. And that is why people like Barbara Forrest are so terrified. Uh, they're, they're, they're paranoid, but they're paranoid because they have enemies. They know that once this mm -hmm. thing flips, they're toast. Pew Research actually states it, it is a majority. It's 51 points percent, you know, which is, that's a majority. Uh, not very much of one, but. Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, but that's the point, is that the hardcore atheists know they're in, they're in the minority. 
and they don't know what to do about it. And they're trying to educate <clears throat> the kids at kindergarten level because the kids of atheist parents are already design advocates, or at least design believers. Uh, oh, so, you, you, you didn't? So, so, my question is, could you have like a seminar in which, you know, like a week-long seminar, you know, five, five days, and, and you present to, to scientifically, you know, trained people, and you present boom, 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 you know. Like this paper. Yeah, like, and, and then four more, or do two of them on a day or something maybe, like that. Maybe you have genetic entropy in the mix or something. Right, and, and you're, you're, you know, these are like literature reviews, and, you know, it's, it's like, you know, just right there, sh you know, just showing it. Um, do you think that for an average um, ev uh, scientist who believes in evolution, is not aware of these things, but is not a committed atheist, um, but they're not, you know, they, they're not a Christian or a believer either, do you, do you really think that a decent percentage of, of them would, would flip? Um, I given that amount of information. don't know the answer to that. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, other people who have done this kind of thing more than I have um, <coughs> say that the biggest thing you want to do is you want to actually get acquainted with these people. And once they realize that you're not the ogre that was being painted and that you actually are honest and that you actually do good work, then they start respecting you and then they start listening and some of them flip and some of them don't but I don't expect to you know to flip everybody um, I think that uh, the the atheism will I think it will die a semi-catastrophic death the, that it will come to the point where there will be some kind of uh, issue that will bring that is, uh, that to the front and uh, and then and then what will happen is that that the the information can no longer be shunted off as as and I don't know that we have control over that. I suppose we should continue to work as we can where we can and let God take care of when that big day comes. The concern I have is that if we are not prepared for step number two, which is how long did it take, that God's not going to let step number one happen. Because I think that he wants the field clear for people to decide what kind of a God we're talking about. So Revelation 13 speaks about wonders that deceive the nations and fire from heaven. It seems to me as though if that were to occur in reality, Undeniable, you know, CNN and people seeing they're invited to a church and they see a, a healing, undeniable, you know, amputation mm -hmm. grow back sort of thing. It seems to me as though if that was, if those sorts of events were happening on a broad scale, that would be the end of atheism, I would imagine. Uh, it might bring attention to the, the subject. <clears throat> uh, you recall that. Not so long ago, we had precisely that kind of evidence presented. And virtually all of it was dismissed as somehow, uh, how should I put it, uh, contrived, including resurrections. I mean, Christ's own activity should have been ample evidence. But because the going ideology at the time did not agree with what Christ represented, none of the evidence of his um, agency and where it's coming from was accepted. You well, recall to be fair, uh, in certain areas it was accepted 
oh. readily. And well, it, well, and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these yeah. men who have uh, turned the ups uh, world upside down are coming here too. Yes. Well, you see, the issue is that if I am committed to an ideology of self-preservation, that runs directly contrary to the mission of love, the mission of mutual support, the mission and, and uh, the, the very principles of life that Christ embodied. You recall the mocking at the cross. He helped others. Himself he cannot help. What kind of a criticism is that? Who did they help? Well, they helped themselves. And they felt that was proof that they were right. See, self-preservation, self-promotion, the ideology of self-advancement ahead of somebody else, that proves I'm better. I'm more right. And you, you're not, you're not measuring up, so that's why you're bad. This is also implicit in the entire suffering issue of, of the quarterly that we're studying now, of Job. And why it was almost like a reflex for Job's friends. Well, you must have done something. Why? We cannot explain all these things happening to you by chance. You must be guilty. And it wasn't by chance either. And it wasn't by chance. It was absolutely correct. It wasn't by chance. The interpretation, however, was entirely wrong. And this is where we really need to get to the crux of the matter. What kind of reality do we really want to be in? Now, people who feel they figured it out and they know how to work it and how to play it and how to end up on top, guess who they can best be represented by? Well, we have an example among the disciples, two people. The irony is that one of them was wrong a lot. The other one was wrong a little bit. But that little bit was incorrigible. And the irony is that the one that was wrong a lot was correctable. Isn't that interesting? Well, actually, all of them that were wrong a lot were correctable because everybody had the same idea. Yes, but Jesus had see, to sit them down and it, say, look, the Gentiles, when they're on top, they just take advantage of it. But, but is, That's not the way we do it. No, this is the, the interesting thing. So, you see, the, the battle between good and evil is not merely who's right. It is what kind of a reality are we going to have? And there won't be a dispute over whether, whether there's a God. It'll be what kind yeah, of a yeah, God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everybody's standing before God at the great judgment day, I once asked one of our good Adventist brothers, how many do you suppose on that awesome day will believe in evolution? Well, he shook. He says, I don't know. I said, well, I do. <laughs> he says, how can you say that? I said, zero. And the answer is very simple. Why? Because everybody's alive. How can you have evolution if everybody's alive? Nothing evolved. When you have resurrections, you can't have evolution. Evolution requires death, permanent. Now you tell me, is that the principle according to which you want hmm, a universe built on? 
Or do you want a universe that actually supports life? I think we need to try and understand uh, the thinking of some of these scientists. And uh, there, there's in general an ethos there that is not without some factual basis that they're scared of religion because it is less testable. Some of them are also scared with religion because its track record has been poor in some places. No, no question. No and its question. track record is still poor in some places. Um, I would not want to be uh, in a religious fight in, uh, in northern Syria right now. I, I think the, uh, one of the cruxes of the, of the issue, though, is uh, are you going to open your horizon of possibilities beyond the materialistic? The materialistic is, is more uh, authenticated to them. They, they, yeah. they do this and this happens. Well, see, that's the thing that Doug has done. His, he has taken their, the, their assumptions and run them into the ground. Yeah, well, and the, the, the richness of this <coughs> presentation today, of course, is that using their system, it doesn't work. Yeah. Their system can't be right. Whatever else is true, that that system is wrong. But still, they they, they like to think in terms of well, we're, we're we believe in cause and effect, and we're, we're dismissing everything else that we can't demonstrate that way. Yeah, which is a very simplistic and limited view of reality. And the crazy part of it is that religion will take the results of this science, which was founded upon an attempt to find a different way from what the Bible said. To free the science from Moses can be interpreted in no other way. Religion loses its uh, ethos, or its, its, ethos, its uh, respect, when it keeps yielding to science. Uh, you know, the, yeah. when, they, when they started following Aristotle, mm -hmm. uh, got into trouble, hey, that didn't work. And they followed uh, Newton, mechanics, and that then came relativity, and that, that fell into trouble. Uh, and the interesting thing of it is they're not following Newton himself, who actually wrote more about religion than he did about science. No, but I'm, talking, uh, I'm just talking about his mechanics. And if, yeah. and if anybody wants to tell me, but he wasn't a real Christian because he was an Aryan or something, hold on. Um, James White, Ellen, uh, Uriah Smith, uh, Joseph Bates, uh, we can go through the list. <laughs> so <laughs> Newton would have felt very comfortable in that company. But uh, by yielding to science, our religion, our theology, the theologians, they, they give up their authority and their respect, incidentally. Arianism isn't what Hitler believed, right? No. <laughs> That's A-R-Y-A-N, and this is A-R-I-A-N. Okay. <laughs> they may be linguistically related, I don't know, but uh, the concepts are certainly not related. Thank you. <laughs> well, anyway... I, I, I think it's been an interesting paper. I think we'll bring to you one or two more. I'll, uh, I think this was better than last time because we actually had time to discuss the paper. Um, and uh, so we'll see. I may take one or two weeks depending on how much material we have. Uh, but uh, the email will tell you how far we'll get. And uh, uh, we'll also give you references in case you want to read it before you come. And then after we get done with this, we'll, uh, we'll look at a video that was put out by Leonard Brand and, um, and Arthur Chadwick, which I think will be extremely informative. And, uh, and we'll just keep going. And those of you who have other thoughts are certainly welcome to bring them and either present them or have me present them or something like that. What? 
He will be here, what is it, the 26th? So we may not be completely done before he gets here. Uh, Sean Pittman is coming down. We're going to give him a Sabbath to talk as well.